We continue with our study of the church of which you read on the pages of the New Testament. And I began by simply saying you should be a member of the church of Christ. I always hasten to say that I use that term the way it is defined and used in the New Testament. All that we think when it comes to salvation should be as the will of Christ presents it in the words of the New Testament. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, John 12, 48. However, if you are a member of a religious organization other than the church of Christ, then I ask you, why are you a member of it? I even say to the members of the church, do you give much thought as to why you are a member of the church? Now, in our first installment in this study, in answering the foregoing question, we pointed out that it could be because your mother and father were members of it, or because it's the one closest to your home, or it has the building, possibly, that appeals to you the most, or as many believe, in fact, the whole denominational world believes, that one church is as good as another, and thus you choose, chose the one that suited you. Such answers as the preceding ones, as I said, are typical. Are typical of people when they have a denominational concept of the church, which concept is not found in the New Testament. In fact, division in the body of Christ is prohibited, is not taught is condemned, 1 Corinthians 1.10. Most people, sadly to say, only have the denominational concept of Christianity. They believe in God and Christ, and they mentally assent to the fact that Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. They accept the Bible as the Word of God, and spend a little time with it, if any. But they do not understand the church as the New Testament gives it. Because denominationalism for 500 years is what's dominated the majority of those that claim the things I just mentioned, believe in God and so on. Well, it is important to receive the facts of Scripture that your faith in Christ as the Son of God can be established for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But we must understand that that faith does, does not save anyone except it be an obedient faith. James, writing to Christians, made that clear in James chapter 2, that faith without works is dead. He is not talking about one trying to work to get the paycheck of heaven because they've done the right work and they merit it, they deserve it. He's talking about the only way that a scriptural faith can be seen in a person is by complying with the wishes or will of our Lord. And thus Jesus would say, even of proper love, if you love me, ye will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. Thus, even from the Old Testament, we see in Ecclesiastes 12 that the conclusion of the whole matter is to fear God and keep his commandments. And that never changes because there's no other way to show one's faith in God, except to comply with his will. So Jesus asked, why call you me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. But it never seems to dawn on people who believe in the denominational concept of the church, and I say here parenthetically, it did not arise till 1,500 years after the Lord's church was established. And you can read that in Acts chapter 2. But it never seems to dawn on them to go back to the Bible as the only rule of faith and practice. And especially the New Testament. Now, whose New Testament is it? The New Testament of Jesus Christ, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. And learn what the true church is. And then be a member of it and be a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less nothing else, 
a member of the church that Jesus purchased with his blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. I say again, the church you can read of in the New Testament, for you will find no denominational churches in the New Testament. Members of the church of Christ are duty-bound to God and to one another and to our fellow human beings to give a biblical answer to them if they ask us why we are members of the church of Christ. We are expected to give a scriptural reason for what the church is and why we're members of it. Yes, we're bold enough to say if in the study of your Bible you find that we are believing or practicing something that's contrary to the Bible, we want to hear about it because we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ someday to give account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or evil. And we're taught explicitly, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer. That means make a defense of what you believe to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. Here's the right disposition with meekness and fear. Then he said, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation, which means your conduct, in Christ. 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Now in our last study, we noticed that the New Testament of the Christ taught that the church was built by the scriptural builder, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Any church not built by Christ is not acceptable to God. It is an identifying mark of the church. We know that if you have children that are lost, that they can take fingerprints or they can do other things that describe that person. It sets that person apart from every other person so that person can be identified and found. So it is with the spiritual body of Christ, the church, Colossians 1.18. Of course you won't recognize them, unless you study the infallible Word of God and specifically the New Testament. For the New Testament of Christ reveals the church of Christ, Romans 16, 16. So we see that the scriptural builder is Christ, and we studied how it has one scriptural foundation, and that is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now one should be a member of the church of Christ because it was founded at the scriptural place. So we're adding another identifying mark. So you can find the church Jesus built. And that is, it was founded in Jerusalem. Any church not founded in Jerusalem is not the church Jesus died to purchase, Acts 20 and 28. If a person should be a member of some church listed as founded in London or Rome or Salt Lake City or New York or podunk holler, wherever it might be, then he knows immediately if he knows his New Testament and believes it to be authoritative that he cannot be a member of the church Jesus built. The Lord's church did not have its origin in any of the places I just mentioned. It was built in Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago. Man just cannot be a member of the scriptural church unless he's a member of the church founded at the scriptural place. Now let's consider some passages which point to the place where the Lord's church was established. We first of all go back to the Messianic prophet, Isaiah, who lived some 700 or more years before Christ walked this earth. He had much to say, Isaiah did, about the coming Messiah or Savior. In Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, the great prophet wrote, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. Now listen, for out of Zion shall go forth the law 
and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Again, that's Isaiah 2, 2, and 3. Keep that prophecy in mind. Let's analyze it further. From this prophecy, we learn first that the Lord's house would be established in Jerusalem. We learn that the Lord's house would be exalted, and we learn that all nations would flow into it. We learn the time of fulfillment would be in what he calls the latter or last days. Now the inspired Apostle Paul, writing many, many years later, after the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, after the church was established in Acts 2, addressed this letter to the young preacher Timothy. He needed to know this. In the preaching of the gospel, he needed to preach it and teach it to those he worked with. And Paul spoke of the house of God, and he defined that house, which is the church of the living God. Now that seems rather simple. So here we read in Isaiah 2, 2 and 3, over 700 years before Christ said, I will build my church, Matthew 16, 18. He said plainly where it would be established. We must understand that it's Jerusalem. That seems simple to me. And we read in Acts chapter 2 that the Lord added to the church daily as such as should be saved. How can you add people who are saved to that which does not exist? Everything talking about the church before Acts chapter 2 is spoken of or is future tense as it speaks about the church. Everything after Acts 2 speaks of the church in existence. Some have even called Acts 2 the hub of the Bible. Because remember, the Bible is designed to give man the knowledge of salvation. Explain to man how God's going to save him from his sins. It unfolds the great scheme of redemption. Now, if you look at another prophet who lived about the same time Isaiah, in Micah chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, you'll see the same prophecy that Isaiah gave, almost given verbatim. So we know what those prophets were teaching by inspiration of the Holy Spirit for fleshly Israel as they look for their Messiah. In Zechariah 1.16, we see that the prophet taught that the church was to have its origin in Jerusalem. Now those prophets spoke the truth of God for Israel who needed to know this so they could be looking for it. In giving his worldwide commission to preach the gospel to every creature, as Mark records it in Mark 16, 15, Jesus taught that Jerusalem was to be the place for the church to start. Now normally we don't look at Luke's account of the Great Commission, but we ought to, because remember one great rule of Bible study. We are to take all of what the Bible teaches on any given subject in its immediate context and remote context before we start thinking about it and drawing conclusions. That's a part of rightly dividing the word of truth which we're commanded to do as we study it and as Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15. We read in Luke 24, verses 46 through 49, Luke's account of the Great Commission. And he, Christ, said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise again the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Do something in somebody's name is to do it by his authority. Among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And to the apostles he said, and ye are witnesses of these things. Again, Luke 24, 46 through 49. Well, let's look at this passage. From it, we notice that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead before something would take place. Before repentance and remission of sins could be preached in his name. I call to your mind your own study of the Bible and your reading of Acts 2. And you'll see therein was the gospel preached in its fullness for the first time by the apostles. And Peter's sermon is recorded by the inspired Luke. And he makes it very clear that he preached the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
And of course, they were convinced, and many cried out to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he took them as those who had been brought to belief in Christ as the Messiah, the Son of God. And he told them as believers, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And we studied about that last week. But what we need to do now is realize that this fits perfectly into the time the church started and the prophets forecasted it would start here. And Jesus, in Luke's account of the Great Commission, made it clear that it would be preached in his name among all nations. What? Repentance and remission of sins. What said in Acts 2.38 to believers? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Was the prophet's prophecy fulfilled? In simple language, it certainly was. So the proclamation of this message was to begin in Jerusalem. And you see that the apostles were to tarry in Jerusalem until they were to be endued with power from on high. That would be when the Comforter whom Jesus had promised to his apostles to take his place when he went back to heaven, who is the Holy Spirit, John 14, 26, would come to them. And thus he did, as is recorded in your Bible in Acts 2. Well, let's consider the fulfillment of these passages. I mentioned already that the Holy Spirit was promised by Christ to the apostles and that he was to come to them after Jesus had gone away. John 16, 7. And you'll remember that Luke records in Acts chapter 1 and verse 9 that the apostles saw Jesus ascend up out of their sight. The apostles were commanded, as I've already said, to wait or to tarry in Jerusalem, Luke 24, 49. And after the apostles watched the Lord's ascension, you'll remember the scripture says they returned to Jerusalem, Acts 1, 12. Now that's the appointed place that they were to tarry or to wait. The apostles were to be clothed with power from on high, Luke 24, 49. No indication man was involved in the administering of that power. It was to come directly from on high. We will not take the time to read it now. But the fulfillment of, Acts, of this is in Acts 2, 1 through 4. The Holy Spirit was to come to the apostles of Jesus Christ in the city of Jerusalem. And we see that he did come on that first Pentecost feast day following the resurrection of Christ. The word of the Lord was to go forth from Jerusalem as the prophet had said. The prophets actually, plural, had said. And it was to take place in what is called the last days or the latter days. Isaiah 2, 2 and 3, Micah 4, 1 and 2. And you'll remember we began by reading Isaiah chapter 2, 2 and 3. I've already pointed out that we have the fulfillment of this prophecy or prophecies in Acts 2, 14 through 42. And in those verses, we have the Apostle Peter's sermon recorded as he stood up with the other apostles preaching the gospel of Christ as they were guided by the Holy Spirit. This occurred in what we know as the last days. In fact, the text of that sermon that Peter preached is found in Joel 2, 28 through 32. And you need to read that also because he says this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, you can't get any more accurate application than when an inspired apostle stands up and says of an inspired prophet that what's happening right here in front of you is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel who said it would come to pass in the last days. So this was the right place, Jerusalem that is, and at the right time. Repentance and remission of sins was to be preached in the Lord's name by his authority. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. And as Colossians 3, 17, as it is on the wall above me, says that we're to do all in the name of Christ, that is by his authority. That's how you know you're right in God's sight. And that's why Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. So repentance and remission of sins was to be preached in the Lord's name, beginning at Jerusalem, Luke 24, 47. 
And this was the message of the Apostle Peter, as we've seen when we quoted Acts 2, 38. The Lord's house, which we've seen to be the church, James 1, 27, was to be established in Jerusalem in the last days, Isaiah 2, 2, and 3. And I've already mentioned Zechariah chapter 1, 16. And that's when and where it was established. Any church built before that or after that, Another place besides Jerusalem cannot be the church that Jesus promised to build in Matthew 16, 18 when he said to the apostles, I will build my church. And the fact that he said in his earthly ministry that it was still in the future means it wasn't built during his lifetime. And when he said that, John the Baptist was already dead, so he didn't have anything to do with the building of the church. And it's the Lord's church which he purchased with his blood. He built it. He's the head of it. He's the builder. He controls it under his authority in the words of the New Testament. That's why Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, verse 48. You'll see too, in uh, verse 41 of Acts 2, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse 47 says, that those that should be saved were added to the church. And by the way, you cannot join the church that Jesus built, the universal church that Jesus built. And Ephesians 4 says there's only one of them, and the identifying marks of it are found in your New Testament. Now, as to whether men have the time or interest to study the New Testament, to learn about it, it's another story, but that's where it's located. And we must remember then that denominationalism came so many, 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 many years later. So beginning at this time, we find the church being spoken of as a reality, while prior to this it was spoken of as a future institution. So according to the prophecies of their, and, and their fulfillment, the Lord's church, and one of those terms that describe it is the term Church of Christ, had its origin in Jerusalem. I say again, for emphasis sake, if you're a member of a church that was founded in some other city, it is not the church Jesus built. If Jesus didn't build the church of which you are a member, some man did, or men, as the case may be, it is not the church Jesus shed his blood to purchase, Acts 20 and verse 28. Now this is the church of which all men must be a member. Well, I say that, and then you'll notice denominationalism places no emphasis on the church as it relates to a person's salvation from sin and going to heaven. Their ideas, I said at the beginning, just mentally affirm that Christ is the Son of God and ask Him into your heart. You can't find that in your New Testament as the way to be saved from your sins, but nevertheless, denominationalism teaches it. But we want to know the truth. Jesus said, if you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. Ignorance of the Bible means ignorance of the truth regarding salvation. Yet Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, talking about those who would believe on him as the Son of God through the preaching of the apostles. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You will never know the truth about anything pertaining to salvation in Christ and remain ignorant of the teaching of the New Testament. There's a reason it's here. It is the infallible, inspired, final, complete, primary source for learning about Christianity. Planning the same church in any community and age is dependent on sowing the same seed, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. Not church succession. Even if one could trace an institution year by year back to its establishment, one would have no assurance that it was the identical institution that existed in the beginning of the one that Jesus built and started in Jerusalem in Acts 2. Over a period of years, a church could so apostatize, that is, fall away from the faith, that it could no longer be a true church. And what's interesting is that in the New Testament, that was predicted and it happened. 
Paul said to the Ephesian elders, as he called them to the Isle of Miletus, to talk about their responsibility in shepherding the flock in Acts 20, 29 through 30, that from among their own selves would men arise, teaching perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And that happened. By 150 A.D., secular history records that the government of the church had changed to where you had one man with more power than the others in the eldership, and he eventually was called the bishop. So bishop meant somebody different from elders, and yet in the New Testament, bishops, elders, pastors, presbyters are all the same persons in the church. They all have the same qualifications to meet, and when they meet them and they're appointed, they're all the same thing. Those terms describe different areas of work for those men who oversee the church. But nevertheless, that's what he's taught. And also, Paul said to that young preacher in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3, that now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, this was being predicted while the New Testament was actually being written. And most of the New Testament is written to members of the church. And in those letters to individuals and churches, he corrects them in many mistakes they were already making even while the New Testament was being written. These passages, as I just mentioned, Acts 20 and 1 Timothy 4, if there are no other passages, and there are, Make it very clear that an apostate church would grow out of the true church because people would leave the doctrine of Christ for what they wanted. That's always been the problem. It was the problem when the first sin was committed by Eve in the garden. She knew the commandment of God. She knew the will of God. Yet, because her fleshly appetites were stronger than her desire to be faithfully obedient to God, she partook of the fruit God had forbade them to take. And she sinned and gave to her husband. He did eat and sin had access to the world. But we are interested today, since we're 2,000 years almost from the time the church was established in Jerusalem, we're interested in seeing if we're sowing the same seed that was sown by the apostles. Denominational churches created upon the commandments and doctrines of men have their manuals, catechisms, prayer books, and disciplines. You don't need those things. The New Testament and specifically in the Bible in general, only will make Christians only and the only Christians. Why should anybody want to be anything else but a Christian, a member of the church Jesus built? Why is there a need to be of anything else? Jesus said the seed was the word of God, Luke 8, 11, as I said earlier. And if we sow the same seed the apostles sowed, the same church will spring forth when people believe and obey it. Galatians 6 and verse 7. And the reason for that is, is the seed principle. Every seed produces after its kind. You know if you want corn and you want to raise it, you've got to plant corn seed. Nobody's ever gone out and planted pumpkin seeds and expected to get corn, or vice versa for that matter. When the seed of the kingdom was sown in the first century, you did not get human denominations that we've known of for about 500 years since the Reformation took place in Europe. Human churches are built on the commandments and doctrines of men. Everybody has a Bible. If nobody else follows the Bible, you can. But you know, human beings are sort of like cows. We're herding people. We like to herd up. We like to follow a majority. No wonder then the Old Testament writer said, Thou shalt not follow a majority to do evil. It's awful easy to commit sin when everybody else around you is doing it. But it's quite another story to stand on the principles of truth for a matter when nobody else is doing it or very few. That just challenges our love of God and faith in God. And will we be found wanting if that ever happens? Today, if the seed of the kingdom is planted in its purity, you'll not get a denomination. You'll get the church that the Lord built in Jerusalem. We must realize that if all the growing corn throughout the world was destroyed, corn would not be destroyed as long as seed corn exists. And the same is true concerning the Lord's church. As long as the seed of the kingdom exists, the true church will never be destroyed. It takes the determination and great faith in God and great conviction. The church can exist anywhere. People will take the Bible and determine to follow it. 
Because you see, Christ wants people to be saved. He doesn't want them lost. It's a matter of our exercising our powers to study the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the finally complete revelation of God and learn the way of salvation and then be willing to divest ourselves of anything that hinders us from doing only what the Lord said. Jesus plainly promised us concerning the word of God, heaven and earth will pass away, by my word shall not pass away, Mark 13, 31. I'm glad that we have this promise from God that in his good providence, though men may cease to believe in him, the word of God, the seed of the kingdom, will always be here for somebody to study and to obey. So we bring this to a conclusion that if we want to have the church that Jesus built and purchased with his own blood in Jerusalem on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, then we must do as Paul said he and Apollos did. Paul said, I planted. He said, Apollos has watered, but it's God who gives the increase. 1 Corinthians 3, 6. Sometimes we sing a song that's been around for a long, long time. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother? In the morning, right and fair. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom? I'm afraid sometimes, like some people have said, when they rearrange and emphasize the wrong words, are you sowing the seed of the kingdom? Dumb brother. And sometimes that's what happened. Dumb meaning not lack of sense, but the original meaning of dumb. I'm not saying a thing about it. Well, sometimes it's hard to stand up for the truth and speak out when everybody around you doesn't want to hear it. But that doesn't mean we are relinquished of our responsibility. We must speak the truth. It's the only hope of this world. And most people simply do not take time. They don't have the interest. They're interested in other things to learn about the church. It's in the Bible. We'll continue with these studies, noticing other identifying marks that are already found and have been for 2,000 years in your New Testament to where God shows you how to identify the church that his son shed his blood to purchase. If you're not a child of God this morning, we urge you to believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, to repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and be buried with your Lord in baptism by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins. That's a simple plan of salvation and each step involved. Yet they'll involve a great transition in your mind to comply with those steps. But there is no other way. Less than that, you can't be saved. More than that's not required. But those things are required. As a child of God, have you erred? Have you committed sin? You need then to repent of that sin in God's second law of salvation. Confess those sins and pray God to forgive us. We have a God in heaven who wants us someday to be with him. But he knows how to get us there. And it's found in his word, especially the New Testament. If you're subject to the gospel call, then we invite you to come while we stand and sing.